FTL has been home to some incredible mods throughout its lifespan. Captain's Edition is probably one of the most well-known mods of all time, and was so ubiquitous in the FTL community throughout the 2010s that I always saw people assuming they had it installed when they played regardless of context. Now, times may have changed, but I still always see people assuming that others are playing with a specific mod, except now, it's Multiverse. Let me give a quick synopsis of how much there is in this mod. The base game has a page of a dozen ships, each with three variants. Multiverse has 17 pages, each with three variants. There are entirely new races, including what feel like several dozen unique ones for certain events, detergent mode, new mechanics in the form of the secondary ship upgrades and toggleable items, a goddamn scroll bar, a load of QOL changes, and of course, a Twitter purchase of additional weaponry and events. Is FTL the best roguelike of all time? Yeah, or at, at least I think so. The genre could be stretched out pretty wide with different definitions, so let me quickly nail down what I mean by roguelike. Nuclear Throne, FTL, Hades, and Vampire Survivors are something you play for maybe 30 minutes to an hour. You play one run, and then that run has no further impact in your game past any meta upgrades that you may unlock. There is no significant narrative progression from one run to the next, like there is in XCOM where you fight an entire war from start to finish. XCOM, Darkest Dungeon, and Total War share a lot of aspects with roguelikes, but I would argue that by definition, they don't really fit. These games are very sandboxy by nature and rely heavily on random elements, which makes them feel very different every time you play, but the significant time commitment per campaign is what sets them apart from what I see as proper roguelikes. In a roguelike, everything is reset between attempts, go again. The main distinction is that you are not playing a campaign, you are playing a run. There are story developments in some roguelikes, but every run begins with largely the same parameters, and are rather disposable. There are no expectations of a large time investment. Games like Battle Brothers fall closer to the realm of RPG 4X, a genre which I talked about all the way back in this video last year. With that distinction made, I think FTL is the best roguelike out there when put against its peers in the genre, like Risk of Rain, Into the Breach, or Hitman 3's Freelancer mode, and that's especially true with Multiverse. FTL's only progression is unlocking new ships, and expanding the number of unlockable ships over tenfold definitely makes that all very exciting. Unlocking the Crystal Cruiser in the vanilla game is such an RNG fest that it's basically a meme, and people who have played for a few hundred hours might not even have it. I'm sure there might be something like that in Multiverse, but when the amount of ships you can unlock is in the hundreds instead of a dozen, I don't care. I have consistently been unlocking on average four new ships to play with every single run, even after playing for quite a long time. You get one from a unique quest that occurred at some point in the run, two variants for the ship I'm piloting from winning, and another fresh ship to play from from the ship progression paths. Each one of those new ship unlocks is like a fresh bounce pad to jump off of to get more stuff too, it just keeps growing on itself. Multiverse takes a lot of inspiration from the plot to Into the Breach. The battle between the Federation and the Rebellion has escalated past just one galaxy. It is now a war being raged across every single timeline. You play as a renegade traveling between universes for the Federation, which, if I understand correctly, effectively makes every single run canon, same as Into the Breach. It's the same song and dance as it is in the vanilla game. Travel to eight sectors, picking up new crew, weapons, and scrap along the way to make your ship stronger and stronger, with your ultimate goal being to defeat the new flagship. There are also half a dozen new additional endings, but the requirements to complete them are pretty RNG dependent, so I wouldn't really factor them in or consider them seriously. Even though I have a lot of time played in this mod, I can only count on one hand the amount of events I have ever seen which are required for the true ending, and you somehow need to see at least four of these in a single run. I don't think this is necessarily bad, though, because facing up against the flagship should always be your end goal, and winning via text box isn't anywhere near as fun. The words that inhabit those text boxes, as in the writing, in this mod, is really good. The original game had a pretty grim, but hopeful tone. You were playing the one ship that could save the Federation from ultimate doom, and the writing reinforced that you were kind of flying through the end of the universe as you marched to save it in secret. Even still, it didn't take itself entirely seriously. There were plenty of events that were clearly meant to be funny or lighthearted, and Multiverse continues that trend. The stakes aren't as dire anymore because there are infinite universes out there, but the realities of war aren't just, you know, shied away from. No longer does the reject surrender button text simply read just that. Instead, it's 
deny their request for salvation. Ignore their plea. This battle can only end Mute with their death and continue Tune fighting. them out. Let their and cries of this. terror go in their way. There will be no mercy. There's this event which pops up a handful of times when destroying a rebel ship, where you capture the rebel officer who attempted to get away via escape pod. The choices you have for how to deal with them are as follows. Welcome them onto your ship. Let them go. Space him. There is a similar event in the vanilla game, and accepting them onto your crew had a chance to have them betray you. I have no idea if this event is the same, because I have never not spaced him. It's unironically the best choice, it has 0% chance of failure. But Multiverse is far from taking itself entirely seriously. There are dozens of new factions and massive lore expansions from Vanilla, but a lot of events that involve interacting with them sound like they're written for a kid show. Maybe like the like the one about a, a kid show. Ellie is a... is an interesting character. Her questline involves murdering her show's producers because they took her off air. She becomes the most overpowered unit in the game after you do this. There are quite a lot of new unique reward NPCs. In vanilla there were like two, but now there's at least a few dozen. Most come with their own unique abilities too, which is really neat, even if I repeatedly completely forgot to use Tully's overpowered as hell bomb move. When you're full up on crew, it is also hilarious to take on these dangerous quests to save these special individuals, only to space them once they arrive on board your ship. Sorry. Humans only. <laughs> I'm not wholly on board with their implementation, though. There's a pretty hard distinction between the writing for quests and events. In quests, generally to get the best outcome, which most of the time is a unique NPC and a new ship to play with later, you pick the, the Mass Effect Paragon choice, and it's pretty railroad and obvious which option is the best one. If at any point you deviate for any reason, the text basically goes, uh, yeah, and then, and then you left. And that's that. There's pretty much no reason to ever select these options. The writing for standard events, however, is much better in my opinion. The best option is not always obvious, and the naive good choice often goes unrewarded, as it should. There's a reason I made a point of all the surrender requests. You will likely not accept any of them. There is no reward for an untainted conscience. The calls for surrender weren't the only vanilla events changed. I'm fairly certain just about every single vanilla event has been changed in some way. You don't just get told about the giant alien spiders anymore. You can see them, shoot them, play as them, and also launch them as bombs. I'm gonna just... I'm just gonna sit here and let that sink in for a second. They're pretty effective, too. The event where you bring aboard space horses to sell? They don't kill crew off-screen anymore. You actually fight them. And they're Ellie's horses! <laughs> Every single run you'll come across Leah the Beam Master, who is basically a joke encounter. They are guaranteed to have only a single beam and nothing else, and canonically never die, instead asking Rebel Command for more ships, over and over again, <laughs> to be minced repeatedly in every run. I thought this joke would run its course, but it serves as a nice reprieve from the stress of the game and is genuinely pretty funny. My favorite encounter with them was pretty late into a run where they spawned two dozen spiders on my ship who all died within two seconds. I don't think FTL is flawless though, as unlike Leah, it does get samey. Multiverse adds a new ship system with a temporal accelerator, but the amount of systems you have available to pick from in total is pretty small, leaving little room for variety. Almost all of this game's variety comes in the form of its weapons and drones, and there's only like five different payloads with lasers, flak, beams, bombs, and missiles. Multiverse does get as much mileage out of these mechanics as physically possible, such as the ballistic autocannons which are technically missile weapons, but operate more like lasers. I love these things. You can even see the rotary cannon rotate, how cool is that? But ultimately, the amount of choices they had to play with for new weapon types is pretty small. You'll find just about every single variant possible, <laughs> and there are some truly unique ones out there, but for the most part, it's largely the same. I am glad boarding actions are a mechanic because they're awesome, but unfortunately playing a heavy cr but unfortunately playing a heavy crew kill playstyle is extremely boring, easy, and without variety. This is even worse in the vanilla game than it is in multiverse, as the mod adds a bunch of new abilities for races to use, which diversifies the kind of scuffles you'll be getting into during boarding, but ultimately it's still sitting in a room and watching health bars deplete alongside the weakest pistol sound in all of media. 
Boarding with a crystal is a lot of fun as you have to lock down rooms at the optimal time to simultaneously trap almost dead crew and keep the alive ones out. I wish this was the standard gameplay rather than something you had to luck into. If you could block or destroy doors, it'd add a lot of strategic depth to the boarding gameplay and make it feel less completely divorced from every other combat mechanic. As it stands, if you're playing a boarding heavy playstyle, you're almost never going to fire weapons unless you have some funny gimmick ones that help boarding actions. The playstyle also almost plays completely identically regardless of what ship you're playing. That can be okay, but remember what I said earlier about the lack of variety? If you're not exchanging or looking for new weapons, all the variety is gone. Double, unfortunately, boarding actions are optimal. You get more rewards for leaving the enemy ship intact, and occasionally drastically more rewards. Luckily for all of us, the fix is extremely simple. Uh, don't use it. Usually this kind of argument is just straight up horrible, as every Stellaris fan on the planet has taught me, but ignoring teleporters isn't like ignoring a core mechanic, it's a playstyle. Not using them is not only, like, possible, but it's also perfectly normal. It's akin to not specking down a certain upgrade path rather than actively trying not to win so that the game is fun. In the aforementioned Stellaris videos that I made, people got real upset at me for saying that games should be engaging on their own without the player having to do the majority of the work. FTL is perfect when it comes to this. You can actively decide to roleplay, you can spare those who ask for mercy, be nice to those who need it, or be an absolute raging asshole, but you don't have to for the game to be fun. I never felt like I needed to indulge in the masturbatory exercise that is single-player roleplaying to make the game engaging, and I pretty much never do, being incredibly bread-minded and all. The core gameplay is fun enough on its own that I don't have to handicap myself and write several essays worth of personal lore for this single-player game to be enjoyable. With that talk about balance out of the way, I do want to clarify that I don't really think it brings FTL down all that much. I don't think you can reasonably expect a single-player roguelike of this nature to be perfectly balanced, whatever that even means, but I thought it was important to acknowledge that this game is definitely not without flaw. Obviously, every game will have optimal strategies and bare meta, it's just an inevitable part of the medium. There's a bunch of stuff in Multiverse that I didn't get to talking about, like the onboard lab, the system upgrades that help reduce augment RNG, toggleable modes for certain drones and weapons, the music selector, the mountains of lore, modular weapons, detergent mode, etc. If you haven't played FTL for a couple years, I would highly recommend giving this a go. It might last you for a while longer. Thanks to all my patrons, you're all quite wonderful people. Love you all, and good night.